Hello, and welcome to the Seattle City Club Engage Civic Connections Luncheon. Uh, it's so strange because this is actually my first time wearing a tie in a very long time. Uh, I can guarantee you my pajama pants do not match my shirt. My name is Joaquin Wee, and I've been a City Club board member for just about two years now. And together with fellow board member, Karen Huelsbeck, we serve as the program committee co-chairs. Uh, a lot of folks who work with me know that I'm a big fan of mission statements and I love reading them aloud and uh, reminding myself and the people I may be gathered with about what has brought us here today. Uh, and I have to start, of course, with the mission statement of Seattle City Club to inform, connect, and engage the public to strengthen the civic health of our region. It's our vision that along with natural wonder, um, innovative businesses and vibrant culture, the Puget Sound region is defined by informed people engaged with their leaders in effective democracy. And I'm proud to say that despite the many obstacles a global pandemic has beset upon all of us in this organization, we have continued to fulfill this vision and this mission. And with your help today, we will continue to evolve and innovate as we inform, connect, and engage. Uh, so we're going to try this. I'd like to see a show of hands out in the audience. And here's how you can do it. Click the icon labeled participants down below, kind of where, like right there where, where my tie cuts off. And um, at the bottom center of your screen, and then at the bottom window on the right hand side of your screen, click the button labeled raise hand. Um, and then ke please keep it raised once that happens. All right, um, I'm going to try that now. There you go. Raising my hand, lowering my hand, raising my hand. Okay, ready? I hope you're ready, here we go. Raise your hand if you've been able to attend a civic cocktail this year. Um, I did. I watched my boss's boss, Mayor Jenny Durkin, and not this time founder, Andre Taylor, talk about how Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. And again, if you raise your hand here, um, please keep it raised. Great. Now raise your hand if you've ever attended a civic boot camp. Not just this year, but any year. A boot camp is how I got involved with City Club. I learned all about how transit hubs have helped shape the city of Seattle. One of my most memorable experiences and how I got more involved with City Club. Now raise your hand if you've attended in person, keep those hands up, keep those hands up, or watched a candidate debate sponsored by our very own Washington Debate Coalition. Please note, debates are coming soon. Lastly, raise your hand if you're thinking about a topic or issue that's maybe shifted the way you think, or maybe you experienced something at City Club and you changed your mind about something. Um, that's why City Club is so committed to the work of informing, connecting and engaging, and yes, maybe even changing hearts and minds. Now, if you believe in this work, and you wanna see it continue, I want to encourage you to consider making a gift today, right now. There are many options in the chat, you'll see to the right, and um, you just follow those links. You don't have to wait, you can do this right now. That's the beauty of this type of format. To sweeten the deal, we have a $20,000 match for all new or additional gifts at the 250 level or above. That means your gift is effectively doubled when you give right now. So your gift of 250 is actually a gift of $500. So don't wait or hesitate, give right now in the chat to the lower right of your screen. Thanks again for talking, uh, excuse me, thanks again for taking some time out of your busy lunches to be here with us today. I'd like to introduce someone who has, uh, even though she's been with City Club for a few short months, I really feel like she, accom she accomplished a whole year's worth of work. So next up, Seattle City Club Executive Director, <clears throat> Whitney Keys. Hey, Joaquin, thank you so much. It's great to see you. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, this past February, two weeks before COVID-19 hit our region, I started in this role. 
And at that time, we quickly lost our office space. A great deal of our funding came to a halt. And I had to quickly build rapport with a brand new team, about 25 different board members, countless community members. And it was a very challenging time for me, for Seattle City Club, and I know for so many of you as well. For inspiration, what I ended up doing was reflecting back upon what it must have been like for our founders. Eight women were instrumental in creating Seattle City Club. And this was back in the 1980s when being a leader was not easy. In fact, at that time, women could not just join community organizations. Our founders, however, did not let this stop them. And instead they came together and created the change that they wanted to see. And this was an inclusive nonprofit forum to foster ideas and debate. And as a result, Seattle City Club was founded and we are still going strong and our mission is still supported today. I was able to virtually meet with a few of these founders just a few weeks ago and it was one of the highlights of my job so far. The conversations were just incredible and their enthusiasm around volunteerism, community leadership and civic engagement was just inspiring. So here are three pieces of advice that they shared with me that I wanna pass along to all of you. The first is we've got to stay informed, whether we're talking about Black Lives Matter, public health, education system, it's really important for us to stay current and on top of these critical issues if we're to be effective volunteers and leaders in our community. Second, we need to stay focused and stay connected to each other, especially during this time of a global pandemic and a time in our society where it is just so easy to silence people's voices, to delete them and to cancel them. We must find ways to come together like we're doing here today during this virtual event and we've got to listen to each other. Our founders saw the value in bringing different people with different perspectives together. And third, we have to stay engaged. To some people, this might be reaching out to an elected official to hold him accountable. To others, it might be having a conversation with a friend about an issue like affordable housing. To some people, it's sending postcards to individuals in other states to get out the vote. To some of you, it might be actually making a plan to be sure you're voting right here in our state of Washington. Today, Seattle City Club keeps a focus on our founders' vision, and we're helping people stay informed, connected, and engaged around the civic issues that matter the most to them. Before we get started with our program, I want to take a moment to thank our annual partners and our Engage sponsors. We especially want to thank Comcast. Comcast has supported us every step of the way, and this year they have made additional investments. In fact, they helped us produce five different videos showcasing positive stories of people who are impacted by our program. So thank you, Comcast. I also want to thank Alaska Airlines, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Boeing, Amazon, BNSF Railway, Lane Powell, and PEMCO Insurance. I now wanna recognize our incredible board members and so many of our community supporters that are here with us today and continue to support our programs. And I wanna thank in advance our program participants and those people are Hanson Hossein, Christina Blocker, Ari Melber, and our very special guest, Rick Steves. Finally, I just wanna personally thank all of you for taking time out of your day to join us over this lunch hour for this critical program that's focused on the election 2020 season and the future of our democracy. And I hope that you'll consider making a financial gift to us today to help ensure that we can continue producing programs like this and help us reach a broader audience and help reach people that do not always have the opportunity to become civically engaged. You can, as Joaquin mentioned, help us meet our $20,000 match. And you can do that by making an additional gift of $250 or more. And now I would like to get on with our program and introduce you to our panel moderator, Hanson Hossein. 
Hanson and I have known each other for a while now. Uh, we met uh, back at the University of Washington. He was the head of the Communication Leadership Master's Program, and I was teaching a course through that program. We've been connected ever since, and conversations with Hanson are riveting. You, at lightning speed, might jump from topics including human connection, technology innovation, social integrity, and global responsibility. And those conversations are always sprinkled with wit and wonder. And so we knew right away that Hansen would be the perfect person to help facilitate this conversation that you're about to hear. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Hansen and let him start the program. Thank you. Thanks very much, Whitney. And I hope I don't introduce any lightning into this conversation. We've had enough shocks to the system so far. As you heard from Whitney, I've had a longstanding relationship with both Seattle City Club and Whitney, which makes it doubly important for me to accept the offer to host this annual event. I'm actually sitting here in um, my empty office here at the University of Washington campus in Seattle. Um, 13 years ago, I had to give a talk here to faculty as they were considering me for the position I held. And they asked me point blank, how television was affecting the elections and expenditures. And I used to be a television reporter. And I said, it wouldn't really matter because the digital revolution that was coming would upset all that. And so that's where we are today, that uh, digital technology is something that we're considering a lot as we think about this election and specifically. But I want to just lay some groundwork for the conversation that we're about to have, that we may want to blame or credit technology for a lot of things that are happening right now. But I, only, I believe they only amplify existing human, uh, human forces. And so for better or for worse, it's whatever we have out there in society that technology makes better or worse. And the same applies to the pandemic. Uh, one of the people I've spoken to recently about this says that all the pandemic has also done is expose existing fissures in our society. And so that's the shock to the system we refer to in the title of this event and the conversation we're about to have it. And, and so this experience really says that we are all connected. And just today, Danny Westing from the Seattle Times says democracy is running at a fever in America. Legit legitimacy of elections is constantly a doubt as a result we're in perpetual campaign fight mode. The so this may look backwards to you using Zoom, but it says America's ugly election uh, on their cover issue last week. But happily for us, we have two remarkable guests to help us understand what's going on, especially in light of the impending election in November. Before we get started, I'd like to make sure you know how this is going to work, so you know how to participate in today's event. At any time during our conversation, you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions to the speakers. I saw that you were experimenting already with the Zoom interface. Just um, type your question or upvote questions from others by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your control panel, and I'll incorporate as many of those audience questions as time will allow into our conversation. So with that, I'd like to introduce our uh, two experts who have graciously decided to join us today. Christina Blocker is an influential political consultant based right here in the Puget Sound area. Her Archway Consulting Group specializes in public relations and diversity and inclusion strategies as it focuses on the nexus of electoral policies and community building, which I love. Christina's work has bridged the divide between communities of color and political leadership. Her clients have included Climate Solutions of the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce. I know both of those organizations, organizations really well. And a number of elected officials, especially in the South Sound. Getting to know Christina in preparation for this conversation, I also appreciate that we have similar family ties to the Caribbean. I also find comfort that I used to inhabit Ari Melber's world, although he may have still been in high school in Seattle when I was at MSNBC in New York when it was founded. But what a powerful voice he has deployed as MSNBC's chief legal correspondent and Emmy Award winning host of The Beat with Ari Melber. Ari's beat is law and justice, supported by his time as a First Amendment lawyer. Um, he also covered the Obama campaign, worked on the John Kerry one, and once worked as a legislative aide to Washington State Senator Maria Cantwell. Now, Ari is clearly lauded for his interview skills, and I hope he doesn't turn the tables on me. So, Christina and Ari, thanks for participating in this important conversation today. Great to be with you and everybody. All yes, right. Thank you so much, Hanson. I, I thought we'll start local first. So, Christina, we'll keep you up on the camera. Um, our mandate today is to discuss democracy's new normal at both the local and national level. I'm beginning to wonder if we're ever going to see normal again. Christina, what strikes you as unique about this November? and the election from the work that you're presently doing. Yeah, so this year has just been a really interesting year, right? None of us could have ever expected the pandemic, but the pandemic has rapidly evolved the way that folks are running for office, how campaigns are being run, 
I mean, just thinking about our landscape right now, we are in one of the largest and greatest civil rights movements in at least my lifetime. Um, and more folks are really speaking about overt and systemic racism, which has been refreshing, especially as a woman that, you know, a woman of color, I'm a black woman and I experience it often. And so to see so many folks, especially this year, I think reacting to not only what's going on nationally, but the things that they're seeing going on locally um, has been really inspiring to see that level of activism. Um, I also think on the local level, folks are, are, are candidates at the very least. Um, are having to find new ways to connect with voters, right? So they're gonna, they're, they have to find somewhat personal ways outside of meeting folks face to face. I've seen more folks utilize virtual phone banks, ver, you know, texting folks, and really making sure that they're utilizing technology like Zoom to, you know, hold fundraisers and connect with folks. So I think that's been really beautiful. Folks have really, you know, been trying their best to engage in different ways. Great, thanks for that. Ari, you just heard Christina reflect upon all the changes that are happening this year, as well as that we're in a moment, as well as there's a movement. I'm curious with your bird's eye view of what's happening in Washington DC in the White House, um, what do you think is the new normal? And also based on your work in previous campaigns. One thing you hear a lot in life and politics is people wanna go back to something. Uh, 2020 has a lot of people going, oh, remember 2019? When you were in it, there were a lot of ways that people had concerns, politically, civic life, et cetera, but in many obvious ways, it seems better than 2020. And yet, just as you can't go back in real life and you can't go back in politics, I think that understandable mood is also basically a, a kind of habit of mind or mental error, um, following and covering and in these protests and interviewing people and engaging with it. It's all about going forward. It's all about taking this moment as hard as it is and as overdue as the reckoning may be and saying, okay, but here we are now, what do we do tomorrow? What do we do next year? And just to give folks one example on the news side, you know, today we're here, we're doing it more remotely, but just like we used to run into the newsroom with, oh my God, did you see this? We're talking. And today we had, oh, uh, you know, a, a health official inside the Trump administration to say nothing of their credibility problems, but even they, um, are saying now, well, vaccine timeline much later into next summer, which means maybe not really saturated or widely safely implemented at, a, at a, a level of herd immunity until later in that year. So all of 21 might look more like this than 19. And then we go on to 22. So it, whether it's political and civic dialogue or literally getting through this pandemic, uh, we have to be really adaptive because we've got a long time to go and it's, I don't think it's about going backwards. Yeah, that, thank you for that reflection, Ari. Um, it is definitely a shock to the system. Christina, as you're, we were listening to Ari speak, I'm curious, obviously he's got that national perspective. How much does the moment that's happening at that level percolate down to what we're seeing here in the Pacific Northwest? Is it a reflection or is there something specifically different around what we have here from political culture that may reflect back differently? Um, I, I think it's a little bit of both, right? I think just looking at our primary election, we had one of the highest voter turnouts that we've ever seen in I'd say more than half a century. So like that was beautiful to see more folks turn out. Um, but then at the same time, as we think about what this November election is gonna look like, we saw a lot of folks, We the turnout that we expected um, especially in certain areas, looked a little bit differently, right? We saw groups, um, Republican-leaning groups, um, turn out in ways that we hadn't seen before. Um, so I definitely say like that 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 was something that was different that we saw for this cycle. Um, but I think what's been beautiful is as a reflection of what's really going on, the activism and the years of heavy lifting. Um, communities that have been typically underserved have, have, have been doing. I think this year, at least in Washington State, I've, I'm so glad to see that there are so many folks of color, especially women of color running for office, um, especially in communities that have been underrepresented. So folks like Tawana Nobles running for Senate um, and then uh, Marilyn Strickland running for Congress. So that's really been exciting. But I think one thing we have to really think about is 
I mean, we've see, we saw it in 2016 and, and I'm sure we're gonna continue to see it now is just making sure that um, that fears of xenophobia from different parts of the United States and within our own state don't um, continue to be our national narrative, right? Um, conversations that are overtly racist don't continue to impact the policies that we have that impact communities. And so I think um, that's what has distinguished us in the past, but I think it's something that we want to make sure that we can continue going into this 2020 November general election. All right, I'm curious, based on what Christina is saying, that, that there, there's a, excel, a higher turnout, a lot more activism. Obviously, there's a politically charged and racially charged conversation going on. Everybody says this this year, election year matters more than anything else in the history of the country, and you've been through enough election cycles to to, to hear that. Um, what what makes what what is the case here? Do you think we're going to see a higher turnout? We're seeing that that transition in terms of more millennials being able to vote than boomers, and and the question is whether young people will actually show up at the ballot box this time. What may be reflective of what we're hearing right now? I think it's harder than ever to know because we are in a pandemic election and we have a few primaries and examples where we've tested out a little bit of what that looks like. And we have the ongoing discussion of voting by mail, absentee, other ways people can try to vote uh, at a distance if that's their best choice for them. And then the, the administration's um, rather ham-handed or sloppy sort of crackdown on that in several ways. So I think it's harder than ever to know. I mean, if 2016 didn't remind everyone the limits of polling, which is not to say that it's useless, it's just to say that it's, approxim it's an approximation. So if things are pretty close and come down to the wire, the poll doesn't tell you much, right? If you poll and find a 20 point gap between, you know, longstanding incumbent and a, a random candidate no one's heard of, that, that probably does tell you more. Um, so th I, I just think we have no idea what a federal election in this pandemic is gonna look like with everything stacked up against it. I do think, since you asked about my past experiences, being both someone on the outside as a now independent reporter and previously having worked inside it. I don't know about y'all, but like, to me, it doesn't feel as intense right now for a September race as normal. Obviously, I think part of that is we just have less of it going on in person physically. So we have less imagery of that. So you don't see and feel like it's constantly going on because it's different. So I think that is also kind of interesting to, to track because that may or may not affect how aware people are of, oh, it's really coming and here's the deadline and you got to get involved. The internet, as we all understand, can be a vector and a force in multiple dimensions. Um, so will it remind people what's going on? Because you see a million posts about it and you, and you click and it's easier than ever to register. Or are you distracted away from it? Or you feel like, oh, I'll get to it later. And, and especially with young people, will they, will they not? So I think there's just a lot in the air. As for the stakes of it, um, you know, I, I think it's a nonpartisan observation that you have an incumbent president who's openly talking about and advocating uh, the denial of democracy. That's a serious thing. It's not the first time it's happened. America's a very young democracy if you measure it by everyone having a clear right to vote, given the history of racism and Jim Crow and everything else. But you still have a president literally saying, well, I want it to be easier to vote in places that support me and harder in places that don't. I wanna do political discrimination. I wanna kneecap the post office. And by the way, maybe vote twice. Oh, I didn't really mean it. I was joking, I'm testing the system. No, you're talking about voter fraud. Uh, so all of that are real things that we talking with the president, which is not to say that it's my job to tell people how to vote or that there aren't other things that his supporters find redeeming about him. But that to me is a different level of stakes right now. I, I think I want to follow up with that, Ari, because you did reference the pandemic and obviously what's going on at the White House with reference to the election. I'm curious, how much does the pandemic either offer uh, obstacle or opportunity based on what either party wants to see happen with this election in terms of voter turnout, in terms of having to resort to using mail-in ballots? How, how is the virus specifically disrupting either positively or negatively? I, I would take that question in two directions. One is the actual sort of political public reaction and the other is the mechanisms of voting. On the first, it's no secret that even cataclysmic events can redound to the benefit of the incumbent, which is counterintuitive, right? Because you'd think if 9-11 is bad, 
And we should have known or tried to stop it or had better intel or taken the threat more seriously, make the list. And then it happens. Then the person who's president of 9-11 seems to politically benefit from it. And you could argue that had that happened to have been a Democrat, they might have benefited from it. And po political scientists have found what they call the rally around the flag effect and various times where regardless of Bay of Pigs, even something that seems like a blunder or that even might not have been handled well can still benefit the incumbent. So I think it, I don't take it as a given that just because there are documented failures in the administration's COVID response, that everyone is going to agree in America that A, it's really the president's fault or B, they're gonna vote against him on that. So I think, uh, and we cover this in our broadcast, but I think it actually is pretty complex. Um, and also, last point on number one, even if you do better, it's still a terrible situation. So a lot of people think Governor Cuomo, for example, has been more pro-science, more thoughtful. I don't think he's been perfect by any means, and we've covered that too, but definitely more like, a, like more close to CDC than the president. But New York has still felt a tremendous amount of pain and tremendous loss of life. And if it were a country, it'd be one of the highest death rates in the world. So again, sometimes when we're all super into politics, we're like, oh, we're grading it very narrowly. But broadly, I think, particularly when it comes to voters who, for whatever reason, may still be undecided, which is wild to imagine, or just don't feel that strongly, they may be like, well, if Cuomo did better and Trump did worse, but people died everywhere, I'm not sure that's going to move my vote. As for number two, to try to wrap it up, long answer, I think on the, me the mechanisms of voting, um, we still have a democracy crisis in, the, in this country. It predates Donald Trump. And until we really fix that at the root, we will always be more susceptible to the exact problems we're having this cycle, which is a complete lack of uniformity, of reliability, uh, uh, general questions about whether your vote's really going to get mailed in time, and then who has the final call on that, and all the sh sh shenanigans of the Electoral College to say nothing of voter suppression and racism. So we need to still, as a nation, Trump or not, deal with that fairly. And I say that again, nonpartisan, we should have a democracy where it is easy, clear, and fair for everyone to vote. And anyone who can't get along with that because they're worried that's going to make them lose shouldn't be in politics in the first place. Thanks. Christian, I'm sure you can reflect generally upon this concept of, of, of the concern around voter suppression and, and showing up to the ballot box as well as the element of racism. However, I'm also curious whether we have some the ch these challenges at that level in Washington state, given our ballot system, which seems to work pretty well. So as you consider the pandemic, either from a voter issue or from a voter turnout point of view, how does that reflect upon what's going on in our state? Yeah, um, and that's a really interesting question, right? Um, I think the pandemic has, if, if anything, highlighted issues that communities continue to face, right? Unemployment, systemic racism, economic crisis, right? And I think one of the challenges, especially when it comes to voter turnout, I see it here in the Puget Sound area, folks are, there, there, there hasn't been enough outreach to voters, especially folks that are that are called at times low propensity voters, but there hasn't been enough outreach to one, make sure that voters are really understanding of what the process looks like to vote. Washington has done a great job of removing barriers, such as remove, ensuring that folks that have been formerly incarcerated have the ability to vote. But I talk to folks in community and a lot of folks still don't know about that, right? Um, we still see folks that do not translate their, their campaign materials, right? And that continues to exclude folks. And, and, and who we think about is, and who we think lives in Washington and who we think matters when it comes to reaching out to them you know, for campaigns. And so I think those, you know, those issues start to play out when we start looking at the policies that we have, right? And so that continues to, to build distress, right? Because if we're not reaching out to voters in an equitable way, if we're not honing in on all of our communities are doing a thorough job of making sure we're connecting with folks. We see that we see that homogenousness within policy, right? And then that continues to build the distrust and continues to have folks where we see it on the national level, where we're seeing folks that rally around personalities as opposed to really drilling in on here are the really specific issues that we need to tackle. What, and, and based on what we know and what Ari re referenced in terms of we think there's not going to be a vaccine until next year at the earliest, 
and obviously I've spoken to experts on this, that the pandemic will continue to flare up over the fall and winter. So we're not really out of the woods till next summer at the earliest. What do you believe the pandemic will have impact wise specifically on Washington state during the election? I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's so, it's, it's interesting. I think, um, I think we're going to see a few things, right? We're going to see, we're going to continue to see folks that um, are going to turn out just like they did in the primary. I think the biggest challenge is going back to what Ari says is the uncertainty of it, right? I think when we looked at our primary primary election and we saw those results, we were we were we were shocked at how certain things fell, right? And so I think thinking about the impacts of COVID, thinking about our the upcoming policies that will come out of it, um, I think there's good things in terms of policy that will happen. Been, right there's been a lot of requests for reformation around certain issues but i think we do really need to hone in on making sure we're doing a better job of informing voters about the process right again washington state has done a great job of making sure that folks could mail in their ballots but a lot of folks don't know that they don't need the stamps right so like how are we making sure that this is equitable we're making a lot of really good policies but we're we may not be doing the best job of communicating those policies which can continue Continue to exclude folks, and so those could impact those those impacts could 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 challenge our our upcoming election. Um, and I, and and going back to what Ari said, the fact that there isn't a whole bunch of buzz about this upcoming election is also a little bit concerning. So, yeah, that's a really surprising revelation, and I I, I thank you for reflecting upon that. We're actually getting questions from people already, so Ari, I'm going to uh, turn this one to you, and from Alma. Why is there so little mention in the national media about what's happening in the ICE detention centers? Um, I, I, and I think there's something that came out yesterday, but I'm curious what, what she, this person wants to know, what would it take to elevate that particular issue as we have this conversation leading up to the election? Well, media questions are always funny because which media are we talking about? Uh, speaking for the beat, which airs at 3 p.m. Pacific for anyone in Seattle. Uh, you know, in all seriousness, we covered last night on the program a whistleblower accounts of what were described as excessive or potentially unnecessarily uh, mandated hysterectomies uh, and other problems in uh, the healthcare, particularly of women in certain ICE detention facilities at a time when they're not even getting COVID tests. So it, the whole thing was, so we covered that last night. I think the question is importantly raising the fact that perhaps uh, in some of the press, it's not coming up. I will say that um, Speaker Pelosi and uh, and Senator Schumer both called for an investigation of that and, and sort of jumped on that particular issue. More broadly, if the question is also about ICE in general, I mean, uh, I return to some of the systemic part, which is what you're trained to think about, especially uh, legally, is uh, the facility where those uh, procedures are being allegedly mandated isn't even under the full control of the U.S. government. It's run by something called LaSalle Corporation, which does detention in prisons. And uh, we have to be informed as a society about who's doing what and who's in control. So there's first, what kind of policies do you want? And then there's, who do you want them to carry it out? And I see a connective tissue even from what's going on with private or profit prisons to what's going on with these wildfires. Uh, in both cases, you have a storyline about well, companies are great, capitalism's great, corporations save money, they're efficient, privatize, privatize, privatize. And then the question is, even in the short run, if it may be true that a corporation cuts the budget, right, for the DHS or, or for whatever, in the long run, where do those costs go and who's paying them? Because a lot of corporations that have contributed to global warming, which makes the fires more likely and more deadly, they're over there. They're not paying the firefighters. Right. They're certainly not risking their lives uh, to fight the fire or this private prison company, which, again, on paper may at some point be something that gets a government bid contract, whether that's locally in Washington state or federally. Is it really who you want to be the last call on this detention when there's human rights and other uh, other aspects to it? So I think it's a it's something to cover and we cover it not only for the scandal or what's happening, but really, wait, is this who you want in charge? Um, because as far as I could tell. If, if a company is responsible for something, it should at least pay the costs. Uh, and on global warming, the costs are, are severe. The tab is going up. 
Yeah, thanks for connecting all the dots there, Ari. And I, I did see the whistleblower uh, story come up on Twitter last night. So it's great that you were able to cover it. And I think that's what the question is referring to, that to see more media response. And clearly you're paying attention to it. Uh, a question for dots, also a great song by Meek Mill. So, <laughs> thanks. Uh, a question for you, Christina, um, and this is from Amy. How can engaged people in Washington State help with voter turnout in battleground states when they're not able to actually physically travel there to canvas? Yeah, that's a great question. And so a lot of the campaigns, I always tell folks, sign up, go to those candidates' websites, and oftentimes their campaign managers will reach out or they'll send you an email and give you opportunities where you can do virtual phone banking or phone banking. Um, and you'll have the script in front of you until so you'll be able to connect with voters that way. And a lot of times campaigns do text banking as well. And text banking is, you know, sending text to several several voters telling folks and in, in educating folks about the candidate and so i would say go to those campaign websites um especially in the states that you're that you're wanting to participate in go to the go to the candidates websites sign up as a supporter um also give a donation no matter how small it is give 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 because those are the, that is a lifeblood of campaigns right um and so but aside from that sign up with the campaign and oftentimes they'll reach out to you and give you a series of options to get engaged especially with it being covid they will have um virtual options for you to be able to participate in that's great great advice thank you another question this one for you ari i think but i think you might both be able to respond and it's from stephanie and this actually reflects upon my own thoughts about the, everybody says that pretty much everybody's decided already. So nothing's going to really move the needle on this election. And the question is, given that from Stephanie, given that there are no undecided voters in the election, and I, in brackets, I don't think that's a controversial statement. What are the decisive factors in this election? So I think we should respond, first of all, already to whether um, that's true, whether people have pretty much made up their mind or there's still some room for movement in the polls. Well, there's polls and then there's your personal experience. No matter where you live in Seattle and outlying areas are perhaps a little different than other parts of the country where you may find higher Republican support. But with regard to whether your mind's made up, yeah, I mean, if you don't know anyone who's undecided and, and the polls show people are highly polarized, then yeah, I think there's far fewer votes up for grabs. Uh, and that's an understandable thing given who's president and what's been going on. Indeed, if anything, my, you know, we, we study this stuff, my observation, I could be wrong, but my observation would be, I think people are even more decided than the polls suggest. For example, the poll, if you believe the polls, Trump allegedly lost some support over the summer around uh, the protests and other problems and allegedly maybe tightened a little more. I don't actually think those voters who were for Trump up until mid 2020, I don't think they really left him. I, my theory of the case would be some of what was happening was so distasteful in his response, uh, so hard to square for people that they spent a few months saying they weren't for Trump anymore. Meaning maybe they would tell a pollster that, maybe they'd tell their friends, I don't know. Let's see in November. Um, because I think that being uncomfortable with a candidate's response to a crisis or embrace of, for example, in Wisconsin, embrace of an alleged murderer. I mean, someone kills two people, they're still legally presumed innocent, but they're indicted for homicide. And the president comes out in that week and starts making an affirmative defense uh, for Mr. Rittenhouse in Wisconsin. I mean, that's bananas. That's never happened in the modern era. And I think there are some Trump voters who went, I'm not sure if I'm for him, we'll see. So I think people are very decided. So, so to the question of, of what, makes, what makes it matter in the, in the race, I think obviously turnout as always will be extra significant. I think whether people who aren't super into either candidate turn out and decide to just go with one of the candidates matters because there's, it's a, in a close race, the green, libertarian, other stuff, and the, some of that hurt uh, Hillary Clinton in some places. Um, and then the cheating matters. Um, the pre as I mentioned earlier, the president is openly trying to cheat and rig the election. So that may also affect turnout. And I don't think the press, in the same way that some of what the, Donald Trump did was initially harder for the press to deal with because it wasn't accustomed to it, 
I don't know that the political press is accustomed to covering a rigged game, which is different than just saying, oh, which team is throwing better today? Oh, but that referee over there was paid off. Do we want to talk about that? Are we going to pretend that's not happening? Uh, and that is a challenge. What do you think, Christina? Is it pretty much a done deal? And you could either answer from your own personal or professional opinion or uh, reflect upon it based on what may be going on in Washington State when it comes to voters' minds being made up. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's a done deal, but I think it's it's too, it's many, it's complex, right? It's igniting the folks that are like, ah, I don't know if I'm as excited about voting for Biden and Harris. And then it's also the folks that were maybe moderate Republicans and, and them being so dissatisfied with Trump, realizing there we, we, we can't continue to co-sign his actions, right? Um, and, and it's that middle groundness, right? And, 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 is, and is there enough, is, is this election enough to ignite those folks that are right in the middle, right? That are, that, that are they passionate enough to really look 10 years out and think about what, what does it mean when we have four more years of Trump, right? What does that mean for our Supreme Court justices, right? What does that mean for policy? How, how far backwards will our, will our country be, right? And what will that mean for the next generation of children that are growing up with COVID and, and the impacts of that, right? And so I think, I think not enough conversation has gone to, like, there's been a lot of conversation about the impacts of him being reelected for this year and the next few years, but I think more conversation should go to what does this look like in the greater scheme, right, within the longer term landscape, what does this mean for our kids, what does this mean for our communities, what does this mean for economic stability for the country, and so I think those conversations um, I think had they happened earlier, it might have it might have helped to ignite more folks. Um, but I, I, I personally, I think there's still room, but we are just on a very short timeline. That's a great perspective, and it actually makes me think about what is the long term horizon after this election, Ari. Um, what will be the legacy of November 2020? Whether it's the day after, if there's no concession, to what will people, what will historians say when they look back on this particular election cycle? I don't know what historians will say. I think that we already were moving away from election day to election weeks, given how it's easier to vote. And so we, we use antiquated models because that's what we're accustomed to. We still ramp up to election day and then have this big evening culturally and media wise where it's that night and then we want to know that night. Um, but we've been moving away from that in the way we vote for a while. And voting experts tend to say it's a good thing because early voting, absentee voting, and mail-in voting, and Washington State being obviously a leader in this, all increase in fran you know, participation in franchisement. So that's a good thing if, if you want people to vote. Um, but then there's just, what are we going to do with this multi-week election? And in the midterms, for example, uh, when it was all counted by about a week plus later in 2018, uh, the blue wave was one of the largest mandates for an opposing party in the last 40 years. And it was 35 plus seats, and it was the most diverse Congress ever elected. And one reason that that was quite misunderstood for a period of time with people on TV on election night, redoing the 2016 mistakes and saying, oh, who knows, and closer than they thought, and not a blue wave, was partly because they just didn't wait for a lot of the house races to come in, some of which were because of mail-in voting, some of which were in California. So even before you get to who wins, which obviously is what people are most interested in, I don't have a prediction on that, I don't know. Um, I just think we're moving towards a different style of election. I think that's broadly positive for democracy. I think we have to be patient. I think we have to remind everyone to vote, remind everyone to participate, and then remind everyone not to panic if there's no result the next morning because it may take time to count all the votes. Um, and then with regard to what's on the line, um, it's possible that the period we're in right now will be the look back on as the good calm time because a second term with President Trump and Attorney General Barr, according to many critics and many observers, um, would be a, a even more severe escalation of the very things that so many people are concerned about. It's possible. Um, I suppose that Trump could be reelected and turn a corner because anything's possible. It's also possible he could lose and go away quietly because 
it was all bluster or he could lose and make it a big clash or Biden could win decisively. So I'll close by saying more so than other years, it's not even just a situation where it's who won and that means everything. It's who wins, how long does that take? Is that legally accepted or fought? And can we as a nation move through that or is there a wider effort to delegitimize or even worse, um, promote unrest? Um, so yeah, it's buckle up. <laughs> well, Ari and Christina, we're clearly living in a moment. And, and as Christina referenced, we're living within movements as well. Um, thank you very much, both of you, for your incredible perspective for this incredible event. And um, yeah, buckle up. We, we, that's what happens when you live in the middle of historic times, right? So um, that's what's going on. And thank you very much for your insights, both of you. This has been a great conversation. And I'm going to pass it back to Whitney, the head of Seattle City Club. Christina, honored to be on with you, Hanson. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Nice yeah. to meet you, Ari. You're amazing. Thank you. <laughs> thank you Great Hansen. to be on with you. Appreciate you. Hanson, Ari, Christina, thank you so much. That was an incredible discussion. And I'm just left realizing how important different policies, different processes, different people are, and the impact that they are going to have in our election season. So very grateful to have all three of you as our speakers today. Um, I want to now, I have actually the great pleasure of introducing our special guest, Rick Steves, and he's going to be our final speaker. While most of us know him as America's authority and author on European travel, Rick is also a passionate advocate when it comes to civic engagement. And according to Rick, experiencing other cultures as well as learning about their history, especially European history, is critical to preserving our democracy. So with that, I would like to again introduce Rick Steves. Thank you, Whitney. And uh, boy, just listening to that conversation there reminded me of the value of the Seattle City Club. It was just a fascinating conversation. And uh, I, I was thinking about uh, how the mission of Seattle City Club kind of mirrors my mission as a travel teacher and a travel writer. Boy, I am all about broadening your perspective through travel and then coming home and being a better citizen from that. And uh, of course, uh, I would say the best souvenir you can bring home is a broader perspective uh, and, and, and an ability to talk with other people and to recognize there's there's you know, the world is not one way or the other, and we need to respect each other and listen. There's a huge value in getting out. Um, my mission as a travel writer is to inspire people to, to reach out. Uh, I guess you could say our mission is to inspire and equip Americans to venture beyond Orlando. Well, that's from a tourism point of view, but if you're doing that from a political discourse point of view, we've got that right here with the Seattle City Club. I think of the values that I've had just in my travels to, to be in Turkey and to go into a stadium and, and, uh, and, uh, and find 200 high school kids having a pep rally and they're all thrusting their fist up into the sky and saying, uh, we are a secular nation. We are a secular nation. I asked my tour guide, what's going on here? Don't they like God? And she says, oh no, we love God. But considering the rising tide of Islamic fundamentalism just across the border, we're having a pep rally for the separation of mosque and state. Wow, a high school stadium in Turkey filled with kids having a pep rally for pluralism. I never realized that was a struggle in that corner of Islam. And when I travel, I gain an empathy for that. Just like when we tune into Seattle City Club or Civic Cocktail and, and share these ideas. On that same trip, we went to a little village with my tour group and uh, we were the first Americans they had ever met. And we came in to that corner and uh, the village took us to the workshop of the woodcarver. He was the most um, proud man in the village. Everybody wanted a prayer niche that he carved. And we gathered around his desk and uh, we watched his work. He was proud. And suddenly he held his chisel high into the sky. And he said, a man and his chisel, the greatest factory on earth. For me, as an American, so addicted to productivity and modern you know, lifestyles to see a medieval wood carver, puffed up and proud with the adoration of his community, doing his work. It was such a beautiful experience. I wanted to buy a piece of his art and he said, no, for a man my age to know that some of my art will go back to the United States of America and be appreciated, that's payment enough here. Take this as a gift from me. And when you go home, remember you have a friend in Turkey. When we reach out 
whether it's through discourse like Seattle City Club or for actually traveling, we become more friends with the other 96% of humanity. We get beyond our borders and we realize we can celebrate the differences. Of course, my beat and my teaching is Europe, and I love to take my groups to little simple slices of life and, and appreciate different different values. Uh, a good example is in France with cheese. You know, they're just evangelic about their cheese. Uh, for me, cheese was no big deal when I grew up. It was orange in the shape of the bread. Here you go, cheese sandwich. Uh, but uh, when you go to a cheese shop, they're just uh, it's a festival of mold, and. Uh, and I'll just never forget going in there and realizing, wow, a lot of people spend a lot of money on cheese. And I can come home and ignore that and go back to my square orange cheese, or I can embrace that and make my world bigger. So this is exciting to me. This really is exciting to me that when we reach out, whether through discourse promoted by Seattle City Club or by actually traveling, we have the same mission to get comfortable with our world and to come home and exercise that broader perspective and be better citizens. You know, during COVID, it's been, it's been a difficult time, especially for travelers. How do you get out? I mean, I'm so wired to travel. I was walking home the other day and uh, saw, uh, <laughs> I saw a snail on my neighbor's fence. And all I could think was escargot. Um, uh, I, I need to travel. I, uh, but what I've been doing this last couple of months is employing my traveler's mindset right here at home. And uh, employing my mindset at home, I'm realizing that uh, we can be positive, we can be curious, we can get out of our comfort zone, we can celebrate diversity. That's what Seattle City Club does. It helps us travel even if we're staying home. And that's something worth supporting. If we think of the challenges that have confronted our society in the last, uh, in, this, in this crazy year 2020, I mean, think of it, we've got COVID, we've got Black Lives Matter, we've got climate change, we've got all this smoke here, we've got you know storms in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. We're confronted by unprecedented challenges. And if we come out of this COVID crisis with, with any important lesson, it's to realize that the existential challenges of our future are not gonna be combated in conventional ways. We don't need walls and we don't need a fancy military. We need to embrace science, we need to communicate, we need to connect and we need to build bridges. It's bridges, not walls, that will make us stronger. And that's one reason I believe supporting Seattle City Club is flat out good citizenship, it toughens the fabric of our community. We've got a time right now all over democracies in this world where there are wannabe dictators employing the same playbook that was employed in Europe in the 1930s to derail democracies. Anytime your political leaders give you simple solutions when they make scapegoats, they discredit journalism and they, they fog up what is a fact and what's not a fact, they are working cleverly and effectively to derail democracies. I made a TV show about this, fascism, lessons from fascism in 20th century Europe. How can we learn from that? It's a big hit in public television all over the country and it is applying right now. Seattle City Club is committed to defending our democracy by not having simple solutions, by not scapegoating, by helping us engage with each other you know, there's so much fear in our society these days, and it's clear to me that fear is for people who don't get out very much. The flip side of fear is understanding. We gain understanding when we get out, and Seattle City Club helps us get out just like a plane ticket does. That's why I'm here reminding you that now more than ever, we need to get out. We need a smart electorate. We need to recognize that, that, that we're at a crossroads in our democracy right now, and uh, history is speaking to us. We need to commit ourselves to a smart electorate. And that really is a matter of supporting organizations like Seattle City Club. Seattle City Club, just like I'm a big fan of public television, I'm a big fan of travel, and I'm a big fan of the mission of Seattle City Club because this is an organization that assumes an attention span, that respects our intelligence, and that brings us information designed not to turn us into mindless producer consumers, but it's designed to inspire us to reach out and engage life and celebrate all its diversity. This is so great. The value of the Seattle City Club to our community and to our democracy is clear. For 40 years, this has been a forum for discussion and for reaching out, for sharing perspectives, from learning from each other. And that's what we're celebrating right now. We've enjoyed that with this conversation that's just been going on. And we're reminded that, that this is not a charity. It's a service. And if you're consuming this service, and if you value this service, 
it just makes sense to support this service. This is flat out good citizenship. The mission of this organization is to inform, inspire, engage, connect. These are more important than ever. And we've got an opportunity right now to make a huge difference. As we've heard, there's a $20,000 match. That means anybody who's gonna give a new or a first time gift of $250 or more will have that, that gift doubled. That'll contribute $500 to the important work of Seattle City Club. So it's pretty clear there's three different ways that you can uh, donate and support Seattle City Club. If you're into this mission, if you wanna make a difference, ha, this is an organization to support. You can uh, check out the link that's provided on the show right now. You can text ENGAGE2020 to 44321, or you can go to seattlecityclub.org slash donate. But you can get on board and you can make a difference. Thanks to, to everybody who makes this an important part of the fabric of our community here in Seattle. And Whitney, back to you. Rick, thank you so much. I'm so inspired by the work that you're doing. And as a little girl, my family picked up one of your books many, many decades ago, and I had the opportunity to go out of this country for the first time. So I really appreciate your work and reminding us that having a broader perspective is critical to our democracy. So everyone, I know we're almost at the end of our program. Just bear with me for a couple more minutes. I really want to um, wrap up and just thank again everyone who made this successful, our sponsors, our board members, but really my team. I have an incredible team of people that have been working so hard to put all this together for you. So thank you, City Club team. And I have deep gratitude for all of you for taking time out of your day today to be with us for this important program and to support our mission. I appreciate you taking time to invest in City Club. I hope you'll consider making a gift to us if you haven't yet. And I do want to say that our video that Comcast produced for us, we had a few technical issues at the beginning of the program. I know the audio wasn't able to be functioning. So we're going to run that now as we close out. And I would encourage you to just take a couple minutes and watch it. All right, everyone, enjoy your afternoon. And thank you so much for supporting Seattle City Club. Now, more than ever, we need an opportunity to have conversations, to listen to each other, to talk with one another, to stay involved. Seattle City Club creates ways for you to get connected, stay informed, and be engaged. Guide your community toward the change you want to see. During the pandemic, Seattle City Club adapted to ensure programs were more accessible to broader and diverse audiences. COVID cannot stop conversation. It's the connection we need. Democracy starts with you. Help support our mission. Your donation creates programs and paths for everyone in your community to get involved. Seattle City Club's work wouldn't be possible without the generous support of many people joining us today. Your ongoing generosity will help this important work continue.